If it's Monday, growing backlash. More Republicans are now criticizing former President Trump for having dinner with a white supremacist at Mar-a-Lago. But the GOP leadership, still silent. Plus, time is short and the lame duck to-do list is long. Can Democrats protect same-sex marriage, avert a government shutdown, fund the military, and much more, all before Republicans take control of the House in January? And all eyes on China. Extremely rare and tense anti-government protests in the communist country as citizens take to the streets to express their outrage after a new round of COVID restrictions. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Kristen Welker. We've got family feuds and a full plate as lawmakers return to Washington. So let's dig in to what's on the table after Thanksgiving. First, family tensions inside the Republican Party. Coincidentally, over a dinner that former president and current presidential candidate Donald Trump had with Ye, formerly known as Kanye West, and a prominent white supremacist, Nick Fuentes. That was last week. Mr. Trump says that Mr. Fuentes' appearance was unexpected and that he did not know his reputation. But it's resulted in a new round of heartburn for Republicans. Party leadership has yet to weigh in. But the conservative-leaning Wall Street Journal editorial board wrote, quote, Mr. Trump isn't going to change, and the next two years will inevitably feature many more such damaging episodes. Republicans who continue to go along for the ride with Mr. Trump are teeing themselves up for disaster in 2024. Louisiana Republican Senator Bill Cassidy, one of seven Republicans who voted to convict Mr. Trump at his second impeachment, said this morning, President Trump hosting racist anti-Semites for dinner encourages other racist anti-Semites. These attitudes are immoral and should not be entertained. This is not the Republican Party. It comes as Republicans are also facing some tensions inside their House caucus as leader Kevin McCarthy is in search of the 218 votes he needs to become Speaker of the House. He's only going to have a three to four seat majority. And right now, there are at least five House Republicans signaling they will not support him. One of McCarthy's top lieutenants, Kentucky Congressman James Comer, was on Meet the Press with Chuck yesterday and acknowledged some of those tensions. I like to support whoever they want. They have their opinions. They have their goals in the conference. Many of them are on my committee. Uh, I'm friends with them, but uh, I'm hopeful at the end of the day that we will come together as a conference and, and elect Kevin. Well, keeping today's Thanksgiving theme going for Democrats, it's not a turkey at the center of the table, but a lame duck. After losing control of the House in the midterm elections, the party has a full menu of things they want to accomplish before the end of the year from must-do spending bills to some real pie-in-the-sky hopes. Current House No. 3, Congressman Jim Clyburn, laid out his wish list yesterday. We need to look at the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Act. I'm not going to get off of that. I do believe that we need to do something about the Electoral uh, Account Reform Act. Yes, keep the government open, but let's also keep fundamental rights protected. And that, to me, will be written into, and these gun safety laws will be closely thereafter. Joining me now is NBC's Mark Caputo. He covers all things Trump world for us. NBC's Sahil Kapoor is on Capitol Hill. And NBC's Mike Memoli is outside the White House. Mark, I want to start with you. Team Trump really in damage control mode after this dinner with Ye and that known white supremacist. What is the campaign saying to you? What's Trump world saying? And do they see this as damage control mode? Yeah, inside Trump world kind of more broadly, his advisors who very often are like, oh, this stuff is overblown, no one. Uh, Mark, I think we may... It's not just what happened. Well, we've lost we've lost contact. I don't know if you can still hear me. Now I can hear you, uh, Mark. Go ahead, repeat what you said, because oh, we missed that we first part. Okay. Well, uh, inside Trump world, uh, his advisors are normally quick to dismiss concerns and criticisms as just being overblown by the media. They're not doing that now. Uh, Internally, they're trying to figure out exactly how Nick Fuentes slipped in here, what sort of procedures they can put in place to make sure this doesn't happen again. So not only are they admitting it's a problem on the back end, that it shouldn't have happened, they're trying to be proactive, make sure that this doesn't happen again. I think that's so fascinating because having covered the Trump White House for four years, 
That was one of the challenges when it came to policing people who came into the Oval Office. And it looked very differently a year in when they realized they needed to have more guardrails. How active are those conversations? Do you anticipate there are going to be some real changes in terms of who can gain access to now candidate Trump? Well, remember this, as you know from covering Donald Trump, the thing with Donald Trump is it's Donald Trump. It's Donald Trump who decides that he doesn't want guardrails. It's Donald Trump who decides he doesn't want to have minders. It's Donald Trump who doesn't want to have a pyramidal structure under him so that he can decide who he's going to meet with and when he's going to meet with, and no one's going to tell him what to do. And so from what we understand, people told him, look, don't have a dinner with Kanye. All right, I think we have lost Mark again. Sahil, let me turn to you. Um, and just very quickly, what's the buzz that you are hearing amongst Republicans on the Hill? Because GOP leadership has been pretty silent about this. We have started to hear from some Republicans, uh, though, who are coming out, not necessarily strongly denouncing this dinner that former President Trump had with this white supremacist and with Kanye West in the wake of his anti-Semitic remarks, but certainly distancing themselves. What's the buzz on the Hill? Well, on Capitol Hill, it's a mix of silence and some denunciation from Republican lawmakers. The Senate is about to gavel in uh, to session. We're going to be talking to a number of Republican senators in the next few hours. But so far, there have been some who have spoken out against uh, Donald Trump having this meeting with that known anti-Semite, that known white supremacist. That includes Bill Cassidy, the uh, Louisiana Republican, who issued the strongest denunciation that I've seen of Donald Trump, named him, said... Uh, and. Uh, I'll quote here, I, uh, President Trump hosting racist anti-Semites for dinner encourages other racist anti-Semites. These attitudes are immoral and should not be entertained. This is not the Republican Party, unquote. I spoke to Senator Susan Collins, the Republican of Maine, who uh, said she condemns white supremacy and anti-Semitism. The president should never, she said, had a meal or even a meeting uh, with Nick Fuentes. And beyond that, uh, there has been uh, the same pattern that we've seen from Republican leaders over many uh, Trump controversies, which is silence. They don't want to get in the middle of it, Kristen. Sahil, I'm going to come back to you in just a moment. I believe we have Mark Caputo back with us. Mark, let me just ask you, broadly speaking, one of the points of announcing his candidacy early was that Mr. Trump wanted to clear the field, right? I mean, he wants to be the strong front runner. Polls show he still is, but that you have a Ron DeSantis catching up with him. Uh, what is the mood inside Trump world when they look at those polls, when they realize that his announcement just did not clear the field as they were hoping it would? Well, one person who is a longtime advisor has told me, I'll paraphrase, it's an effing nightmare. Mm. Uh, and this is one of the reasons you hear Ron DeSantis's footsteps. And understand that Trump, th after he announced, wound up with three controversies back to back to back. First, you had a special counsel announced two days after his announcement. Then, a few days after that, on Tuesday of last week, the U.S. Supreme Court says, look, you got to release your taxes. That's something that Donald Trump promised to do before he ran in 2016. And then later that evening, he winds up this dinner with Kanye West and Nick Fuentes. And let's remember, when he had this dinner with Kanye West, people told him not to do it. Kanye West, at that point, was an avowed anti-Semite or had been making avowedly anti-Semitic remarks. So Nick Fuentes or not, whether he knew Nick Fuentes was going to be there or not, the reality was is Donald Trump decided to have dinner with someone who was talking about the Jews and using, you know, rather vile and racist and anti-Semitic remarks. So now he's paying the price for that. Mm. Such great reporting, Mark. Really appreciate it and appreciate your sticking in with us through some of those technical difficulties. Sahil, let me go back to you. Let's talk about uh, what's happening on Capitol Hill. Uh, the lame duck session, as we talked about at the top, Democrats have quite a long to-do list and the clock is ticking. Realistically speaking, uh, you heard Congressman Clyburn lay out his list of priorities. Realistically speaking, what do Democrats think they can accomplish? Well, Kristen, it's a very full list, and the most uh, perilous thing for Democrats is that in the two weeks post-election since they first opened their door, they have not cleared a single uh, item 
off that plate. So let's tick through them quickly. There's the same-sex marriage bill, which did clear a procedural hurdle in the Senate recently. It's on a, a glide path to passage, but that could take all week in the Senate. Beyond that, they have until December 16th to strike a deal to fund the government. That uh, seemed, you know, that there was a lot of optimism surrounding that, but it's not clear if that optimism persists at this point. There is the possibility that it slips, and if it slips to next year, then the House Republicans are not going to tolerate anything like this kind of a deal. They're going to have to start from square one and potentially continue to run the government on autopilot. There is the NDAA, the uh, reauthorization of the Pentagon. Uh, again, unclear where that stands. There are a host of extraneous demands. There's some uh, uh, simmering controversy about Ukraine funding that could uh, gum this up. There is the Electoral Count Act bill, the legislation to prevent, you know, another January 6th to prevent stolen elections in the future. There's optimism about this. The clock is ticking, yes, but that bill has passed the House. A version of it has enough support to pass the Senate. They just have to find the time uh, to do it. And beyond that, I, I made a list here because there's uh, a lot. January 6th <laughs> committee has to issue its final report and legislative recommendations. They have uh, not closed the door to another hearing to roll out those legislative recommendations since they have to meet to adopt the report. Those are the items that they still hope to get done. Then there are the, the kind of wish list, maybe pie in the sky items. Democrats want to, some of them at least, want to eliminate the threat of debt ceiling brinkmanship. That's going to be a very heavy lift because it'll require Republican support. There's some talk of an immigration deal and a DACA, you know, something to deal with the dreamers. They've been trying that for two decades. There's nothing I've seen that uh, indicates they can do this in the final few weeks of this year. And voting rights, as uh, Mr. Mr. Clyburn mentioned that is simply not going to happen. The best Democrats can hope for is a, a, a modest piece of legislation that deals not with voting rights, but uh, stealing elections. That has bipartisan support, Kristen. Well, Sahil, you laid out the menu very well. Very quickly before I go to Mike Memoli, uh, talk about how steep the road is for Kevin McCarthy to win the speaker's gavel. Obviously, there's going to be a vote in January. It's looking pretty rough at this moment, Kristen, and there's some deja vu for Kevin McCarthy. This is his third attempt here. He uh, was the heir apparent to become Speaker in 2015, had to drop that bid because of a lack of support. He came just a few votes away from winning the House majority in 2020, in which he would have been a shoo-in uh, for Speaker. He fell short of that, and now again, he's looking at a narrow majority. He's next in line to be Speaker, but as you, as you point out, more than those four votes he will likely have to spare uh, in the Republican caucus have said they are going to uh, oppose him. The question is, how movable are those votes? Mm -hmm. We know that the far right of the House Republican caucus is willing to flex their muscle. They're willing to deal embarrassments to House Republican leadership on the floor of the chamber, and that is the battle that Kevin McCarthy is fighting. We see him leaning in uh, toward the right, you know, tilting right, trying to channel some of the uh, uh, grievances and some of the concerns of his right-wing members to try to win their votes. It's not clear, though, it, whether it'll be enough. Well, the White House will be watching all of this very closely. Mike Memoli, let me turn to you and talk about some of the priorities on the table for the White House, because uh, during his Thanksgiving break, in the wake of two more horrific mass shootings, President Biden again saying that he wants an assault weapons ban. Some of the new members of Congress are saying, look, put it up for a vote. Even though it doesn't seem like we have the votes, it's a priority. We want to move on this. We want to take a stand on this. But it seems awfully difficult to see that that's going to happen. Mike, what's the White House saying? Yeah, Kristen, Sahil did a great job of laying out the very crowded menu of mm -hmm. options ahead of Democrats in this lame duck session. And this a possibility that Chris Murphy, the senator from Connecticut, who's been such a leader on this issue of gun safety reforms, floated over the weekend that he thinks there is potentially 60 votes in the Senate for a version of an assault weapons ban. We have heard President Biden repeatedly in the closing months of the midterm campaign and even since then say that getting a new form of a ban on assault weapons is a high priority for him. He reminds us that he was able to pass that when he was a senator, chair of the Judiciary Committee, and is committed to doing that again. You can add that to the list, potentially, of want-to-dos in this lame duck session. And I'll add a couple other emergency, potentially, options that the White House is looking at. We've been talking about this possibility, Kristen, of a potential rail strike mm -hmm. with uh, four of these uh, 12 labor unions that are involved uh, in the rail supply supply chain, as it were, uh, having voted down this compromise effort. There's increasingly talk both on the side of labor, on Capitol Hill, and even among some at the White House that the possibility of Congress acting legislatively to impose the compromise deal that President Biden heralded just a couple months ago is also potentially on the table. So the White House has been looking at what this lame duck session could look like 
And knowing that the time is so scarce, I'll add one other variable, Kristen. They know that in a 50-50 Senate, and remember, we still are looking at a 50-50 Senate for the next few weeks, uh, depending on that outcome of Georgia, depends on what happens in the Georgia runoff. There's no business that they really think they can conduct until that runoff concludes next Tuesday. And so that constrains the timeline to get a lot of this work done even further. Yeah, Georgia on everyone's minds, that's for sure. Mike, very quickly, um, President Biden was asked about the dinner that former President Trump had, and he said, you don't want to know what I think. Is this a strategic decision not to engage directly? Obviously, a White House spokesperson, Andrew Bates, put out a statement condemning the dinner, but the president's not engaging yet. Yeah, that's right. That statement from Andrew Bates did say that this kind of anti-Semitism bigotry has no place in America, including at Mar-a-Lago, saying that this kind of uh, Holocaust denialism must be uh, condemned across the board. I think it's worth noting the context in which this is happening, Kristen, right? Because we know the other sort of uh, thing hanging out there is the president's own decision about his political future coming up in the next few months. He talks so often ahead of his 2020 campaign about how it was President Trump's response to Charlottesville that really was really the final trigger that put him into the 2020 mm -hmm. race. And think about what we're seeing now from the former president. That is just another factor for the president to add into his decision about his uh, likely re-election campaign at this point. Great point, Mike Memley. Thank you so much. And before that, Sahil Kapoor and Mark Caputo. And continuing our Thanksgiving theme here and turning to what you might call the leftovers of the 2022 midterm elections, the Georgia Senate runoff, where election officials are reporting huge turnout in early voting with just eight days until that election. Joining me now in Georgia is Greg Bluestein, politics reporter for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. He is also an NBC News contributor. So great to see you. Uh, we were talking at the end of last week about the fact that people were going to turn out to the polls on Saturday in early voting. And so far, it seems like the numbers are pretty big. Um, from this weekend. Do you have a sense of where the turnout was, which candidate has benefited so far? Yeah, well, more than 150,000 people voted over the weekend. Today is on pace for a record early voting in-person day, um, even in, you know, even when compared to 2020. So an explosion of turnout. What we do know about the weekend was that there was heaviest turnout in Metro Atlanta, in Democratic-leaning areas. Uh, we, 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 you know, we hear confidence from the Democratic campaigns that uh, that they're building a cushion over the weekend of early votes. Um, disproportionate number of African Americans voted early over the weekend. About more than 40 percent of the early voters were African American, which is which is far higher than uh, the black proportion of the Georgia electorate. So that's good news for Democrats too, since black voters are the backbone of the Democratic electorate here. Um, so so far we're seeing that explosion. We can we can at least uh, uh, hypothesize that explosion is helping Democratic incumbents. Raphael Warnock. Yeah, and it's also notable Warnock is actually out raising Walker two to one. How significant is that? Of course, fundraising isn't always an indicator of which way the winds are blowing, but there's no doubt that having those extra dollars helps when you are running in, in an incredibly competitive race. Exactly. It helps him in a few ways. First of all, he can blanket the airwaves with ads. We've seen a number of ads, including innovative ads that, uh, that Senator Warnock's campaign has put out. Second, it puts the pressure on Herschel Walker. He had no events over the weekend. Um, he has had his last event was about a week ago, whereas Senator Warnock has had a number of events. Uh, Herschel Walker has been doing closed door fundraisers because he's trying to at least not catch up, but at least kind of sort of keep pace right now. So we're seeing that happen. And third, the, the 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 fundraising um, uh, explosion, I guess you could say, is also helping Senator Warnock use unconventional ways to spend that money. Mm -hmm. So he is uh, funding a campaign essentially to get hard to reach voters. He's funding airplanes that are flying over college campuses, towing banners that say "Remember to vote early," uh, billboards at bus stops, things that you don't necessarily see uh, you know, a campaign that's cash strapped even think about doing. Mm -hmm. Now, you also have some new reporting about Walker deciding to be silent about the Trump controversy that we've been talking about throughout the show, former President Trump having dinner with that known white supremacist in Kanye West. What can you tell us? Yeah, well, Herschel Walker's taking the same strategy that many national Republicans are, which is sidestepping or trying to sidestep this controversy, this, this Trump appearing with a racist, anti-Semitic Holocaust denier altogether. 
uh, Herschel Walker's campaign said it was not going to comment. We'll see if he says anything on the campaign trail about it. Um, but meanwhile, other top Republicans here in Georgia are taking a very different stance. We've heard from Governor Brian Kemp, Attorney General Chris Carr, and Lieutenant Governor like Burt Jones, all condemning uh, the, the, this uh, Fuentes' anti-Semitism as racism. Mm. Well, Greg, I, I know it's going to be a busy several days for you. Thank you so much for joining us and bringing us all of your great reporting. We really appreciate it. Thank and you. coming up, we will have more on former President Trump's Mar-a-Lago meeting with a notorious racist and anti-Semite on the far right in an episode that one longtime Trump advisor is calling a nightmare for Republicans, plus grueling conditions and frigid temperatures as Russian missiles rain down on Ukraine cities. We are live in Kyiv. That's ahead. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. We have more now on the fallout from former President Donald Trump's dinner alongside rapper Ye and white supremacist Nick Fuentes. As we reported, we have seen some pushback from Republicans in Washington, including Senators Bill Cassidy and Susan Collins. Neither is up for re-election, though, until 2026. That is important because so far it's been mostly silence from Republicans facing re-election in the next cycle, which is most of them. And those who have spoken out appear to be treading very cautiously. Take a listen to what Representative James Comer, who's in line to chair the powerful House Oversight Committee, told Chuck yesterday. Oh, and apparently we do not have that soundbite, but he walked a very fine line, not outright condemning it, but basically saying he would not have taken that dinner himself. Joining me now is our panel, Politico congressional reporter Nicholas Wu, Simone Sanders Townsend, host of Simone on MSNBC and former chief spokesperson for Vice President Harris, and Rick Tyler, Republican strategist and NBC political analyst. Thanks so much to all of you for being here. Hope you had a fantastic holiday. Likewise. Rick, let me start with you. What do you make of Republicans treading so cautiously when it comes to this dinner with a white supremacist? I don't know. When you, when you when someone places a beach ball on a golf tee, you knock it out of the park. Uh, this was a dis <laughs> disgraceful action uh, by the former president. It actually changes nothing. He was unfit to uh, hold office before he sat down to that dinner. He was unfit for office after he got up from the dinner. So essentially nothing's changed. President Trump is probably happy because he got actually more coverage on this story than he did for his uh, announcement for mm. re-election. Uh, he did nothing to clear the field and now has made it uh, much uh, worse for himself. And, Nicholas, really complicating things for Republicans. Those who are up for re-election, of course, you have the Georgia runoff. We'll talk about that more in depth in a, in a few minutes. But how? what are Republicans saying about how awkward and difficult this moment is for them? Yet another moment where they're being forced to defend or respond to the actions of former President Trump. Well, what's notable about what, notable about what Republicans are saying is that they're really not saying much at all. It, 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 there's been mostly silence from elected Republicans on this. And to me, as a congressional watcher, this feels very 2017 in mm. some ways, right? Mm -hmm. Yet again, it's another instance where the former president, or in that case, when he was president, meets with some sort of controversial guest or someone, and then elected Republicans have to awkwardly dodge questions and run away from reporters in the halls about yeah. that. And whether this was sloppy advance work or... Or, or just, you know, willful incompetence by uh, Trump's folks, you know, remains to be seen. But this is still something that Republicans just don't want to be talking about. Simone, Mike Memoli made such a great point in the previous segment, which is that President Biden has not weighed in on this. His spokesperson did condemn it. Um, but this is the type of thing that fueled his decision to run the first time around. Here he is trying to determine whether he's going to run a second time around. Do you think this plays a role, this moment? Does it become a data point as he sits down to try to make this final decision? See, I don't know if this becomes a data point. Look, I think that uh, President Biden wants to run for re-election and barring some, you know, outside thing that we don't might, that we don't necessarily know about or some, you know, conversations with his family, I think we should expect that he will be running for re-election and will announce his bid in a, a timely fashion. I, I do, I just, I just think that, look, this is who Donald Trump is. 
I don't know why people are surprised. And furthermore, the dinner, if anyone else had dinner with Kanye West this week, we would have been for, we would have been asking them about their, you know, do they stand with Kanye? What are their views mm -hmm. on anti-Semitism? Mm -hmm. Do they condemn? And not the, you know, white supremacist plus one that was brought to the dinner that, for all we know, barely said anything. And so while I can, we condemn white supremacy, I, I think we should also all condemn anti-Semitism. We should not be surprised if the former president is unable to do either or both. And every single instance that he has been initially asked to condemn something that to Rick's point, a beach ball on a golf tee, honey, just do it. He has whipped at it and only when he is pushed and prodded does he come around on the back end. Yeah, here you guys are saying the same phrase. That's impressive, Rick. Let me follow up with you. I'm mean, stealing your talking points, Rick. Okay, when well, you see it on my show, this, it was you. We don't see that a whole lot. I want to follow up with you on, on something that you said, Rick, in your first comment, though, which is that he did not clear the field. That was the whole point of Mr. Trump announcing early and someone who you worked with, a former Cruz campaign chair, um, Bob Vanderplatz, said this to Politico, quote, the people talking about Trump's campaign announcement in my circles, it's almost like it didn't happen. That's quite a statement. Yeah, Bob Vanderplatz, of course, is a, a mover and shaker in the Iowa caucuses. Yeah. He's a faith leader there. And in Iowa, in the Republican caucuses, you have to win the faith vote, the Christian vote. Uh, to go anywhere. And so it's not just Bob Vanderplatz. Uh, many people are walking. There's been a shift. Uh, it's taken far too long, but people, it's particularly the donor class, uh, I had a, a major donor uh, who sat next to me the other night, said, you know, Rick, how can we keep Trump from running? And I said, he doesn't listen to me, so I don't, <laughs> I don't know. But he doesn't want Trump to run. Money's walking away from him. Uh, the Republicans just want him to, to go away. Uh, so so we'll, we'll see. But... Um, it's not good for Republicans the longer he stays around. Can I say that there's a point about this about the grassroots? I think part of the reason to Nicholas's point that a number of congressional Republicans have not rushed to condemn the former president is because there are a large swath of voters in this country who are still with him. They're not the majority, but there are enough of them to where folks, Republicans, don't want to upset those folks and still get those votes. And that is why I think that President Trump is still a factor. I think that's such an important point. You can never count former President Trump out. If you look at the polls, he's still the clear front runner in the Republican field. He did not clear the field, but if you look at it, he still has about a 15-point advantage ahead of a Ron DeSantis, for example. What's notable, though, Nicholas, is that you have some of these Republicans, Nikki Haley, for example, who ha was kind of sitting on the sidelines. Then she went to this event in Las Vegas and signaled she's more seriously considering a potential run. So you actually have more Republicans eyeing getting into this race now. The danger here, though, for Republicans is that if you end up with a field with, you know, say, half a dozen candidates, you end up splitting the anti-Trump vote. And, you know, you could have a redux of 2016 all over again, where Trump you know, manages to climb to the top and vanquishes everyone else. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, let's talk about uh, Leader McCarthy. He is trying to become speaker. And as we just had a Sahil Kapoor report that it's going to be a very steep climb for him. Do you think, strategically speaking, he is on the path to twist enough arms to do that? What, what's your reporting tell you? Well, it kind of remains to be seen exactly how he's going to twist all these arms. There's still you know, a little more than a month or so until people actually will be on the floor of the House and be forced to vote yes or no or present um, on, on, on the Speaker of the House. And, and that is actually what could happen here. There's, there's five Republicans uh, who have said they could oppose McCarthy for Speaker. But, it, you know, we're waiting to see whether that means they're actually a firm no or if they'll vote present, which would lower the overall threshold required to be Speaker. So in, in 2015... Um, John Boehner won the speakership with 216 votes. You do not need 218 votes. That's a big thing. Everybody keeps saying that. It's not true. Uh, Nancy Pelosi won with 216 votes. Not a lot of arm twisting behind the scenes for Nancy Pelosi and Boehner. And yeah. the fact is, these five Republicans who are saying no, in fact, may not vote for McCarthy, don't need to vote for McCarthy. If they sit out the vote, then it's a majority of the, those who cast the vote, uh, which is what I think they'll do. I don't think... The, 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 the uh, more right part of the party in the, in the, the Freedom Caucus is, is going to vote for a Democrat for Speaker. That's yeah. not going to happen. So he will at, at least convince some of them to either vote for him or to sit it out. And uh, Kevin McCarthy will be Speaker of the House. All right. And since we are running short on time, I do want to talk about Georgia Simone um, before we finish this segment. What is your sense? Clearly, early voting so far, the turnout has been robust. Um, may have exceeded expectations. 
Uh, what are you hearing and what is your sense on the ground about what's happening? What I have been hearing from folks is uh, this past Saturday was the first day of it, Saturday in-person early voting, the only day, because there is no in-person early voting next Saturday. Um, seven, more than 79,000 people came out to vote, particularly, in, it was only in two counties, Fulton County, one of the biggest blue dots was there. Uh, young people, the third highest group that came out to vote in that county, 18 to 24. Today, the Georgia Secretary of State is saying that Monday could pipe possibly be the highest, mm. the best turnout in all the history of early voting in Georgia. Yeah. 165,000 plus people at least. So we have enough data now, I think. Um, so in the, in the counties that are blue, and I think 40% mm -hmm. of the uh, early turnout is, is African Americans. So okay. if I could speak for the African Americans for a second, they are not, <laughs> they are not going to miss the chance to vote uh, to have an African American re uh, representative in the U.S. Senate. So it's between uh, two of yeah. them, but they yeah. typically vote Democrat. And so this is not this is not a good scenario uh, mm -hmm. for Walker. The other thing on the Republican side is there are a lot of Republicans who want to be senator of Georgia who do not want Walker representing them right. for the next six years. So I don't I, and the Senate is not at stake. Not, whatever happens, the Democrats will be in charge of the Senate. So I think they'll wait it out. And I think um, we're not going to get reelected. You have to you have to factor that in. I think the fact that the Senate is not on the line and yet, Nicholas, final word to you. How big of a deal is it for Democrats if they are able to expand their lead by just one vote? It's a huge deal. There's a, there's a world of difference between a 50-50 Senate and a 51-49 Senate. A 51-49 Senate allows Joe Manchin to vote no on everything, and you can still get your judges and your other appointees through. And that's the kind of cushion Democrats want. All right. Well, fantastic conversation to start us off on this Monday after Thanksgiving. It was a hearty discussion. Nicholas, Simone, and Rick, thank you so much. Coming up next, weaponizing winter. We are on the ground in Kyiv as Ukrainian officials struggle to keep the lights on amid Russia's escalating attacks on civilian infrastructure. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. President Zelensky is warning residents to prepare for more missile attacks by Russia, even as millions of Ukrainians remain without power. According to Ukraine's Ministry of Defense, Russia has launched more than 16,000 missile attacks on Ukraine over the past nine months. They estimate that 97 percent of those attacks were aimed at civilian targets. In response, Ukraine has set up community centers called Points of Invincibility that provide basic services, including electricity, Internet, food and water. Meanwhile, Russia has unilaterally postponed nuclear arms control talks with the U.S. That's according to a State Department spokesperson. The talks were expected to take place in Cairo this week amid increased concerns that Russia might consider use of a tactical nuclear weapon against Ukraine as the war drags now into its 10th month. Joining me now is NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber, who is on the ground in Kyiv. And Ellison, we should note that the light behind you is a combination of light and fog, that you're not standing in front of a fire. Um, Ellison, bring us up to speed here. Just how devastating have these power outages and hits against the electricity and power grid been? They're upending people's lives, right? I mean, you see weird things happen, like this situation we're in right now, where because it's so cold, it's been snowing here, you have the fog rolling in, and then the majority of Kiev, everything that is usually lit up, up over here, big churches, big buildings, it's all dark tonight. There's this one area down in the square, uh, a stone throw from where we're standing, where they have some tanks that are set up, leftover Russian tanks from when they initially uh, tried to come into Kiev in the early days of the full-scale invasion, and there are lights next to that and those lights are creating this weird effect because it's pretty much the only light we're seeing in Kyiv right now. In terms of power outages, it really fluctuates um, by area, by region, depending on when people are experiencing this. But it's very difficult because it's very cold and when the power goes out, the heat goes out and a lot of people are left trying to scramble and figure out what they do next. That's where places like points of invincibility, these warming centers that are being set up by the government and NGOs alike are incredibly important for people, oftentimes people living in small villages who really don't have the option to flee uh, to other areas where the energy grid, the electric grid is perhaps more stable. So after the airstrike last week, Wednesday, immediately almost within hours of the barrage of missiles, you had 12 million people, 12 million customers in Ukraine without electricity. By Friday, that had been cut in half to about 6 million. At this point, President Zelensky says, well, there are still power outages taking place across the 
country. He says that the ones you're seeing right now are related to planned emergency disruptions, not that missile attack on Wednesday. But from that warning we have uh, from him now, it seems like people in Ukraine could be back in the same situation they were less than a week ago. Kristen? It's just remarkable how resilient the people of Ukraine and of Kyiv had been. Um, there is some new reporting, Ellison, about the possibility that Russia may be leaving that power plant, plant Zaporizhia. What can yeah. you tell us about that? Is, is that true? Yes, yeah, so there's been back and forth here between what Ukrainian officials are saying and what Russian officials are saying. You also have some outside groups saying that they've seen some of what Ukrainian officials say that they have seen, like the Institute for the Study of War. But what Ukrainian officials, a top ranking energy official said was that they were noticing some indications, some signs, particularly some chatter in Russian state TV suggesting that they could be laying the groundwork to then leave uh, this nuclear power plant that they have controlled for quite a while now and either turn it over to some sort of third party UN watchdog or just leave outright, but that they hadn't seen evidence that they were leaving at this point in time, just that they thought were, they were laying the steps, if you will, to possibly make that decision. Uh, the spokesperson uh, for the Kremlin, he says that this is not true at all, that they have no intention of leaving. Uh, but again, you do have that third party group now, the Institute for the Study of War think tank based in the state saying they're seeing some of the signs that Ukrainian officials said they were seeing as well to indicate it could be kind of a soft launch to Russia backing out of that area. Ellison, Kristen. just very, very quickly, Ellison, just put into context, how significant mm -hmm. would that be? I mean, when this war first started, we spent so much time focused yeah. on the fact that Russia was invading that power plant. There was so much concern about it. How significant would it be? It would be a very big deal. This is the largest nuclear power plant in Europe. The fact that not only has it been controlled by Russian forces for so long has been concerning to other uh, European nations, but you will also have had this situation where there has been shelling at this plant on a number of different occasions. Moscow and Kyiv trading blame on who did it, but UN watchdog group saying, hey, doesn't matter who did it. This is jeopardizing a lot of people's lives and we could have something incredibly catastrophic come from this. I think last time it happened, you had the head of the UN watchdog um, for nuclear sites like this saying, I don't care who fired it, this is dangerous, stop. Um, so this would be a very big deal if we saw particularly a third party come in and take this over. All Kristen. Right. Incredible reporting as always. Ellison, please do continue to stay safe. We really appreciate your joining us. After the break, an extraordinary show of defiance in China as protesters call for more freedom and clash with authorities over the government's harsh COVID restrictions. We'll delve into all of this. You're watching Meet the Press now. Stay with us. Welcome back. China's Communist Party is facing its fiercest resistance in decades as thousands of protesters angry over the country's zero COVID policy take to the streets. The protests erupted over the weekend in cities across the country, sparked by a deadly fire in western China that critics say was made worse by COVID restrictions. Demonstrators, some of whom were calling for the ouster of President Xi Jinping, clashed with security personnel. It all comes amid growing frustration over China's strict anti-COVID measures, some of the toughest in the world. NBC's Janice Mackey Freyer has more from Beijing. Extraordinary scenes across China with protests in multiple cities against the government's zero COVID rules. People chanting for freedom from the policy that has controlled every aspect of daily life and holding up blank pieces of paper as a protest against censorship with the internet here being scrubbed of any signs of discontent. In Shanghai, some protesters even openly dared to call for leader Xi Jinping to step down, which is unheard of in China. Now, this swell of anger was triggered by a deadly apartment fire in Xinjiang. Lockdown measures at the building there being blamed because emergency crews took three hours to put out the flames. Videos emerged on social media showing candlelight vigils 
for the fire victims, as well as the shows of frustration. People calling for an end to lockdowns, an end to testing. In Chengdu, they shouted unblock, while in Guangzhou, they actually did knock down barriers. China's government has tried tweaking its zero COVID rules, but with cases now at a record high, they're bearing down again with restrictions. Quelling the unrest remains a challenge for the Communist Party. They have a heavier police presence in several major cities tonight, but there is no clear exit from zero COVID in sight. All right, Janice Mackey Frayer, thank you so much for that report. I'm joined now by Bonnie Lin, director of the China Power Project at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Bonnie, thank you so much for joining me. Really appreciate it. Christian, thank you for allowing me to join you today. Can you put the protests that we are seeing into context? China has not experienced anything like this in decades, and I wonder what the fallout could be. Could there be a real threat to the Xi regime? Well, that's an excellent question. I think right now what we're seeing since we're at around day three of this is not yet a clear threat to the um, to, to Xi's regime. So in context, you mentioned that there are now thousands of protesters in China, but I think it's important to note that so far but what we know, it's about a dozen or more locations, and at each of the locations, it's been pockets of hundreds of protesters. We haven't seen so far a location where there are thousands or tens of thousands of protesters. So in context, when we look at the largest um, Chinese protest in 1989, that was Tiananmen, we had up to a million mm. Chinese protesters con uh, concentrated in Beijing. That's not the case we're seeing now. We're seeing pockets of hundreds of protesters in dozens, if not more locations throughout China. So not yet the same scale and not yet in the way that it could threaten Xi's uh, consolidation or, or his control on power so far. It's such an important point. And because we are seeing uh, these disparate protests, I wonder if you can help us understand what's really behind them, because you have different mm -hmm. protesters saying different things. For some, it is about the harsh COVID restrictions and the lockdowns. But for others, it's about calling for an ouster to President Xi. What are the various messages that you think need to be highlighted to help people understand what these protests are really about? So what we've seen typically in terms of protests in China is protesters will typically grab onto something that is linked to what they have grievances about. And then it's not atypical for protests to spiral into various different demands. So as you mentioned, one demand is uh, basically reversing or, or 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 moving China from its zero COVID policy. We also see demands for more democracy, for more freedom in China. We also see demands for more greater representation, um, these blank pages mm. that you're displaying right now also also is a criticism of the censorship, the lack of freedom in China. So we're seeing a range of demands. But I would say the fundamental anchoring behind all the protests is zero COVID. It's China's harsh COVID lockdowns that to date we have only seen very minor rollbacks. And as the world is watching what's happening, for example, you know, World Cup, pro, World Cup games are being streamed in China, right? They're seeing that most of the world has returned to pre-COVID conditions, and China is, not, is so very far from that. And very quickly, Bonnie, before I let you go, th this comes on the heels of President Biden meeting with President Xi Jinping just a few weeks ago. How do you expect the White House, the president, to respond? How should they respond and walk? I think what a lot of foreign policy experts would say needs to be a, a fine line in this moment. You know, I think what the, what President Biden and the White House needs to look at is um, encouraging China to really be vaccinating its population. Because right now, one of the reasons why China is not opening up is the fact that it's relying on the domestic vaccines and a good portion of elderly in China do not have boosters. So I think it's mm. working with China to make sure they have the right vaccines and really emphasizing to the Chinese leadership they need to take the concerns of their population into consideration. And I know I said last question, but I do have one more. What are you going to be watching for in these coming days and weeks to get a sense of where these protests are headed? Great question. I would be watching to see if we see any more protests uh, in the coming days, if they, the numbers have been increasing, and to see if, as people are getting arrested, as the police are increasing its presence, if they're having any dampening effect on the protests. Because if they're not, it could be something much larger than what we're seeing right now. Mm. Okay. Bonnie Lin, thank you so much for your insights. We really appreciate it. Good to see you. Thank you very much.
And before we go to break, we are excited to celebrate 75 years of Meet the Press all month long with highlights and clips from the archive, which you can explore online using our special interactive website. Just scan the QR code on your screen right now that you see there. In light of this weekend's widespread demonstrations in China that we were just talking about, we went back to the spring of 1989, which Bonnie Lin just referenced. Here's former U.S. ambassador to China Winston Lord discussing the Tiananmen Square protests on Meet the Press. What is your prognosis for what's going to happen in Beijing? Is there a power struggle there? Do the government leaders dare to move on the demonstrators? I think we should separate out the long term and the short term, what is clear and what is not clear. What is not clear is what's going to happen over the next few days. What is clear already is that we are witnessing one of the most important historical events since World War II, that China will never be the same, that if there is violence and bloodshed, it is the government's fault. They have made some grave, potentially tragic mistakes in recent weeks. And I think it's also clear that Li Peng is finished politically sooner or later. Now, with respect to your specific question, there's obvious debate going on. Li Peng has asserted uh, the hard line at this point. I think Zhao Ziyang is waiting around to pick up the pieces. Uh, he is careful not to ally himself directly with the demonstrators and students. That would uh, subject him to charges of disloyalty. But I think he is there in case things go wrong. Welcome back. U.S. employers are searching for workers to fill millions of open jobs as worker shortages slow the supply chain and inflate prices. Immigrants to the U.S. often play a key role in filling those labor gaps, but our legal immigration system has fallen behind in bringing those workers in and granting them the correct visas to stay. CNBC's Steve Leisman took a deep dive into the impact of the failings of the legal immigration system on our economy in a new three-part series. We're taking an in-depth look at how the antiquated process of bringing skilled labor into the country drives the labor shortage and inflation. These issues could mean lower growth in the future if the U.S. doesn't fix the problem. For most Americans, the immigration debate focuses on the illegal side how to secure the border from the millions of undocumented immigrants who enter the U.S. every year, and how they should be treated once they arrive. But America also has a massive legal immigration problem, one with far-reaching consequences for the economy. Experts say the antiquated system is broken, playing a big part in the nation's shortage of educated workers, especially in the vital medical and technology sectors. The broken system helps push up inflation, and experts say plays a role in making illegal immigration worse. We're talking about worrying about recessions. We're talking about inflation. I think we're going to have a bigger catastrophe if we don't get more workers into our society, and we do that by immigration. A recent note from Goldman Sachs points to a fall-off in immigration and says the biggest gap between job openings and available workers in post-war history is one of the key reasons that inflation is soaring. An increase in foreign-born workers could help contain the rise in wages and prices. The consequences go further. In rural communities, the lack of foreign health care workers has driven up wait times and plays a role in hospital closures and even health outcomes. For the country, the crisis may be causing America to lose the contest for the best and the brightest around the world, a contest that could mean losing its technological edge. Immigration attorney Bo Cooper says among his clients, he's seen skilled immigrants leave. That's a loss to our economy. Um, the, the legal immigration system is meant to serve the U.S. national interest by allowing us to import um, intellectual talent to fill our, our, our skill needs. So how bad is the legal immigration system? This year, 48,000 employers asked to bring in 484,000 skilled workers from abroad under just one visa program. That's the H-1B program for skilled employees. But they were granted just 85,000 approvals, or only one out of about every six applications. Normally, it's one out of every two or three. Our immigration system is designed for an era in American history that does not exist anymore. Um, a lot of the programs that were designed uh, were created back in the 90s. Our immigration system desperately needs to be updated to meet the needs of our nation today. That's especially true in the wake of the pandemic, which saw an increase in retirees and others leaving the workforce. The result of the system? a shortfall of as many as 1.6 million legal immigrant workers in the nation. There are 10.7 million job openings and only about 6 million unemployed. So about a third of that gap, experts say, is the lack of foreign workers. 
While foreign-born are only 12% of the population, they are roughly 40 to 50% of the STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, labor force. And so they contribute massively to this part of the economy. Staying at this level will definitely jeopardize that engine of growth for the U.S. Perry estimates that U.S. growth could be up to a half a percentage point lower if we don't fix the immigration problem. But in rural areas where doctors are a major factor in the hospital worker shortage, the consequences can be life and death. Kristen? Great report on a really critical issue. Steve Leisman, thank you for that. We do have one more headline before we go. This from Hawaii. The world's largest active volcano erupted this morning for the first time in nearly four decades. This remarkable video from Hawaii's Big Island shows the Mauna Loa volcano turning the skies above it red as the volcano released volcanic ash and lava. Officials say the lava flows are currently contained to the volcano's summit and are not a threat, but warn the situation could change rapidly. Incredible sight there. And that does it for us this hour. I will be back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. NBC News Now coverage continues with my friend Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.